dark, cold world out there. There's a time to live and a time for a man to die. There are places for dead men in the earth and the sky. Don't you venture too far now, cause you can't come back from the place where Hello, everybody, and welcome to an all-new edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. It's a new year. It's a new episode. We've been gone for a little, a little while, but here we are. We're back in the flash and on your screen. I am Bobby Munson, and joining me right to the side, if I know where to point with using these screens, he's right there. You know him. He is the man with the angelic voice. He's Papa Spokes. Papa Spokes, it has been way too long, sir. How you doing? I'm doing great, Munson, and you're right. It's been a much too long. Uh, the world keeps turning around and throwing little obstacles in our path, but we're back with a new episode. We really are, and we're excited about it. We got lots to unfold. There's a lot of things that we missed talking about over the last couple of months. Uh, but before we do that, we're going to ask you tuning in right now to go ahead and click the like button down below, subscribe to our channel, hit the notification bell. You've heard it all before. If you've ever been on a video on YouTube, we need those subscribers. We need those likes because the more you do that, it more bumps our ratings up and the more people can find out all about the great content that we're putting out here on the Video Bros Network. Big shout out also goes to... Give that point to you right, right there, Backbreaker Podcast. The good, good pals over at Backbreakers have uh, been really good to us. Uh, Mike has done lots for us, and we want to support them. Uh, we are part of Backbreaker Podcast, so you'll be able to find Ring Respect Radio anywhere you can find back Backbreaker Podcast. I'm stumbling over my words here tonight, Pop Smokes. It's been that long. I'm out of practice. But do you think I would be in practice? Because, hey, guess what? You can still catch me every single Sunday on Sunday Brunch with Love Wrestling. Uh, speaking of Love Wrestling, I wanted to give a quick shout-out to a guy who joined me this Sunday. Uh, his name is Kyle Shaw. He is also known as the Canadian Goose on the independent wrestling circuit here in Western Canada. I want to give him a shout-out tonight, Pop Smokes, because he is also a member of the Backbreaker team uh, doing his show Monday Night Shaw on Backbreaker Podcast that you can also catch, as well as joining me at, from time to time on Love Wrestling. The man's been putting in the hours. He's been working hard at uh, the Academy out there training with guys like michael richard blaze and getting to know his craft even better and i want to wish him nothing but the best of luck in his future endeavors and he also expressed a little a little interest in coming out our way sometime he really really wants to make his way to saskatchewan papa smokes he told me all about it and hey maybe it'll happen one day because you know what we do have here in saskatchewan we've got prairie pro wrestling and you and I were fortunate enough to be back at a Prairie Pro Wrestling event in the middle of January. It was January the 15th as Prairie Pro Wrestling presented 628 days later as we continued the title search. We want to crown our first champion. We got to the quarterfinal matchups there, Papa Smokes. It was a great night and a lot of great wins that went down. We've got four amazing talents left in this title tournament. Yeah, what a good time that was, Munson, and uh, everybody braved the cold and came out that night. Very excellent turnout as usual, and, uh, you know, the video bros were busy with their uh, cameras at ringside and all that stuff. Great, great time, great tournament, and now we're down to four. This is getting really exciting. Yeah. Anxious to hand out that PPW gold, that beautiful belt we got, and uh, we need someone, uh, we need a waste for that to go around, and I can't wait to have that. We really do. And we're going to be able to get those matches to you, the fans, hopefully sooner rather than later. We've been uh, hard at work getting those together and Papa Smokes and I need to get together to call those matchups for you. Uh, we got matchups from our October show and also the ones from January as well, too. Uh, we are down to four. So spoiler alert, I'm going to reveal those right now. What we have left in the Prairie Pro Wrestling Championship title tournament, we have got Tony Novak, who came off with a big win against El Asino at the last show, had a huge pop from the Saskatoon crowd. Great to see Tony Novak making it this deep into the tournament. We also have Mike McSugar in this tournament as well, too. One of the odds-on favorite to go all the way. We got one of our good favorites, Sheik Akbar Shabazz, still in this thing. A very big threat to that title win. And then we've got the ever-popular man in Saskatoon here, Michael Allen Richard Clark, who has got to be, honestly, the fan favorite going into this thing to pick up the Prairie Pro Wrestling Championship. Uh, take nothing away from that man. He is very accomplished. He has won championships everywhere he goes. And I could foresee him becoming the very first Prairie Pro Wrestling Champion. But I could see it with any four of these guys pop smokes. They all have what it takes to get to the top. 
Yeah, this is just awesome. The, you can see the cream is rising to the top in this tournament. We had some wild matches, but, uh, you know, not everybody can get through and uh, the, the best gets through. And like you say, we got four left and uh, this is going to be big for the next show, probably sometime in March. We haven't announced that quite yet, but I'm anticipating something next month and uh, totally excited for this. Excited to make the call on the video afterwards. Just excited for it all around. Yeah, it's going to be a great time and hopefully you'll be able to join us when that comes to the live uh, programming as well too here in Saskatoon and if you can as always check out Prairie Pro Wrestling on YouTube where you can hear myself and Pop Smokes calling all the action from the great talent that we have here in Western Canada. Speaking of great talent though there is a company that has much great talent and they keep bringing in new talent that is Major League Wrestling MLW Pop Smokes a company that we've talked a lot about here on the show and we're going to talk about in depth here once again because we have episodes to talk about from MLW Fusion's return before we do because we got missed out on the opportunity with uh being busy around the holidays and then just uh, generally working a lot of the time, not being able to reconnect just yet. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the trip to Mexico, MLW heading on down to Tijuana, Mexico for MLW Presents Azteca Underground. Uh, this was a very interesting and different turn of events for MLW. It got them out of the Philadelphia area. Uh, they did two different versions of the tapings here, two pop smokes. And this is one of the highlights that I did like. First of all, that arena in Tijuana is beautiful. What a great setup. I thought that looked incredible. But then to do the underground fight club idea with that buried in cement look with the ring in the middle, very minimal fans, that cage around the outside, like this looked scary. And I liked the setup of it. That was, to me, one of the biggest highlights coming out of Azteca Underground on a personal level. Well, for sure. And you know what that was, don't you, Munson? Like I was trying to figure that out too, those those, some of those matches were taped in the daytime in the outdoor setting, like you were saying, the concrete thing. That was clearly the exercise yard of an abandoned jail, don't you think? Like, that's exactly yeah. what that looked like to me. And like you say, it looked a bit scary. Like, it looks uh, intimidating in a way. It's an excellent place to throw a wrestling taping. Hardly anyone watching in there, but it, it was the fight club. And uh, I liked the way it looked. It was something different. Yeah, I mean, in some ways it had that same feel to when MLW was doing the empty arenas, only with a very limited amount of people allowed inside, but a much scarier look at the same time. Yeah, it was in that daytime, but that cage around the up top and that just that feeling of like that kind of closed in area and stuff like that really kind of gave you the feeling of true fear and stuff within there. And I love that touch. I think it was excellent by MLW. Uh, I think it was nice to get them out of the Philly crowd and see how people would react outside of the country even was a really well done thing. Uh, we got to see a lot of talents that maybe we weren't familiar with that came out of, uh, out of the, uh, you know, uh, tri I'm assuming AAA and a lot of the different uh, uh, wrestling programs that they have there in Mexico as well, too. Uh, one of the ones that obviously is carried over and come over to MLW on a regular basis, uh, Pagano. Uh, he was featured in that first main event there, the multi-man match with Hammerstone, Pagano, um, uh, Neil Mortez, and I, I can't remember the other dude's name at the at top of my head here, but it was a big man match, and obviously Pagano can hold his own. He seems like he's a real kind of hardcore death match guy most of the time, which isn't personally my cup of tea, and I know it's not necessarily yours either, Pop Smokes, but when he was handling himself in a wrestling aspect, he bumped around nicely, he held his own pretty decently, he's a meaty man inside there, and he could lay some shit in that looked pretty decent, so, I mean, I'm on board with Pagano on a wrestling on a wrestling side, I mean, I, I could do without the, the brawls and all that kind of stuff, personally, but I don't have a problem personally with Pagano and think that I can see why Court Bauer would invest in getting this guy over to come do some more work with MLW. And, and I'm assuming, too, that, that we're not familiar with his scene so much, but we have to assume that he's a top guy down there too. If MLW puts him at the top of their card too. Uh, uh, yeah. Like I say, we don't know this guy's body of work or, or what his reception is down in Mexico, but I'm going to assume it's pretty strong. He's got the clown thing going on. I liked his t-shirt that said, there's no party until the clown gets there. Yeah. Uh, he's kind of got a Brandon Lee, the crow kind of thing going on too. It's popular with young people. They like that misfit stuff like that. A, a guy who uh, is successful because he doesn't care. Like, yeah, it, it's kind of a neat thing. 
it's it's not my thing completely, but it, it's kind of like a Darby Allen type thing. It's the young kids that like him because he's a he's a, a brooding misfit kind of character, and th- I think that'll always have an audience. Oh, for sure it will. So definitely can see why they would go that direction. So, you know, a couple of highlights from Azteca Underground that we touched on there. A couple of things that we really liked from it. Uh, there was a lot of featuring Hammerstone. Obviously, Cesar Duran really wants to get that title off of Hammerstone and has tried everything within his power to make this happen. Uh, we're going to get to a lot of that here, though, as we start to talk about MLW Fusion. So we're back to Fusion now. This is the start of a new season, so they've dropped MLW Fusion Alpha that we were reviewing just previously. And now we're on to MLW Fusion again. This is considered episode 132 of MLW Fusion. Uh, we kick things right off with uh, Caesar Duran cutting a promo. Uh, he is talking highly about Alexander Hammerstone, how he needs to get the title off him. He makes a reference that Hammerstone is like Texas. All talk, no fight. And then he talks about how Pagano tonight is going to take that belt from Alexander Hammerstone and never will he defend it in in America again or an MLW ring. Yeah, and not to mention the the match is falls count anywhere, no rules. So, yeah, yeah he's he's setting up Pagano perfectly because he wants to get the belt off Hammerstone. Yeah, and he'll do whatever it takes. So that's how we kicked off the night. And then we go right down to the ring for in-ring action. We're joined on commentary by uh, Joe Dabrowski and Rich uh, Bocchini there now. I'm, I'm just getting used to the two of them being the guys. And I, I'm starting to get on board with that. I was really on board with St. Laurent and was kind of missing him. But we'll get to St. Laurent a little bit later in this episode, as yeah. it is, so, which is a good thing, too, because I like that boy. Um, so we're kicking it off with them. Um, I also want to bring up, before we even get into this match, the ring announcer for MLW, and I don't like to, I don't like to harp too much on people, but sometimes it's fun. <laughs> this guy has got to be the driest in-ring announcer I have ever <laughs> heard in professional wrestling. It's like he doesn't want to be there. It seems like somebody sucked the life out of this guy years ago and then slapped a microphone in front of him and said, "Here, say these names on this card in front of you." Like, I just, I don't know if it's just what they want or what they're going for, but it feels so flat to me, Bob Smokes. And I just, Court Bauer, I'm right here, dude. I'll do it. (laughs) I'll do it. I'll do it for half what that you're paying that guy just to do it. (laughs) Come on, man. Yeah. Give me a call. (laughs) And you know, the thing is, it's funny because nowadays, I mean, since, since the Fink, I guess it's kind of been the thing of ring announcers to go the other way, to go overboard. I mean, listen to that that goof in AEW, the ring announcer they have. It's just absolutely awful, right, on the, the other side of the scale. But this guy's just completely underplays it. I, I don't know what he's up to, but it, he, he needs to put something more into that. Yeah, just a little bit of oomph. Like, I mean, let's talk about ring announcers for one moment. And a big shout-out to J.G. Muller, who does the ring announcing for Prairie Pro Wrestling, and I think does – one of the most marvelous jobs. And this isn't just because we know him and we work with him. He is a fantastic in-ring announcer. He does an excellent job, conducts himself professionally, and he has just that little extra oomph. It's not over the top. He knows how to scale it back, and he knows how to deliver to make it sound just right. He does an excellent job for us. And he's not trying to get himself over like some ring announcers are too. He knows his spot is to announce the uh, the details that he needs to announce so that the crowd understands clearly like that's the main part of the job and jg's the best i still say he's the best in the business he really is and uh applaud to him and you know what corbara you can call me but if you really want someone good jg muller is your guy too so yeah give either one of us a call i'll listen to jg any day but back to mlw's in-ring action here papa smokes talking about the first match of the evening on one episode 132 it is a Caribbean Championship match or a Caribbean Championship rematch, so to speak. Richard Holiday challenging champion King Muertes for the Caribbean Championship. Uh, this one, uh, aside from the start of it with the exchanging of chops, which once again, I know how much this drives you, I'd say, in the back and forth, back and forth. I really think to myself when I'm watching this, why can't someone just one of these days challenge it? Like, come on, hit me, hit me. And as soon as a dude goes to throw a punch or a chop or whatever in the exchange format, Grab them, feed them three times, back them into the corner. Kind of thing. It's so unexpected at this point. At this point, everybody expects you to go back and forth, chop for chop, punch for punch, and everything. I just wish guys would mix it up once in a while now. 
Yeah, me too. And and you know, even uh, aside from chops and uh, and stuff, the they just use those those forearms, those phony looking forearms where you just kind of lay it along the side of the guy's neck or whatever. Don't worry about whether it really comes close or not because it's it's just a it's just an exhibition. Like I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't like these spots at all. Why would you invite and let a guy hit you? Yeah. Well, that's what I keep thinking to myself. Like, dude's going to throw a punch at me. I might invite him, but I'm only luring him in to punch, punch him out right away. Kind to of give thing. him, so, yeah, to take one to give him four, you know? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, but with that being said, that is probably my nitpick of the entire match, which is pretty good because the match itself is good. I like both these yeah. dudes. Richard Holiday looked really good in this matchup he really got to show off his strength he wasn't trying to sell that he had been hurt from previously or anything like that so there's nothing bugging him uh so this one went really decently um yeah you had a bit of a screwy finish there with the uh azteca henchman coming out for the distraction but i think this was the way to make holiday not look weak in defeat at the same time he still looks strong yeah. he went toe-to-toe with a guy who i would consider a main eventer <clears throat> in mlw with king king Muertes, and had to get screwed out of winning his championship back i think this was a good look for holiday a great look for king Muertes, who continues to rack up the wins in mlw and i i like this 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 with this was a strong start for me yeah me too i i always like holiday's matches i think he's a good wrestler He's confident. He's uh, totally in control and cool in all of his matches. You can see he never gets messed up in his spots. He never flubs any of his uh, moves or anything like that. Because he's athletic and strong, he can do all that stuff. Same thing with Muertes. You can see that he's a little bit older and a little bit rickety. You know, like when he when he bends down to like do stuff to holiday when he's lying on the mat, you can see that he's like pretty stiff and all that stuff. And maybe doesn't have so many years left in the ring, but Hey, it's his look, man. And his whole persona, he's already over. Muertes is, is terrifying. As we said, from the very first time he came to MLW, he's so big. He's got the crazy eyes. He's got the cool mask and the Aztec outfit with the feathers and the, the skull and the whole death thing. Like, I mean, he's over, it's good shit. Yeah. So, I mean, if there's a couple of uh, small deficiencies in his in-ring stuff, and I mean, small, the, he knows what he's doing. I mean, he's good. Uh, it, and you get the same kind of pretty decent match out of him every time. And uh, this was no exception. And uh, he went over on holiday with a little bit of interference and, uh, this, as we'll talk about in the future here, of course, has has a significance to what's going to happen, but we're not going to talk about that quite yet. But this was good. I like this. And, and we've been talking about Holiday for a long time now, too, that he's good, but he needs his chance. He needs his big match or his angle or his moment. And I think this is coming as well. We'll talk about this in a little bit. We sure will. We're going to get to that. And speaking of guys who are having their moment and – a guy who we've got to see start this whole thing with Azteca Underground and uh, get to do another part of it here. And probably one of the most intriguing things I've watched on MLW television outside of the quality matchups that have been there. This sit down with Jacob fought to this real life sit down where he got to explain his entire story. And man, I could have watched a whole Ken Burns documentary on Jacob fought to talking about his story. I mean, this was excellent, Papa Smokes. I think Jacob fought too is fantastic. This did not ruin any of the mystique of how much of a badass this guy is. This just added to it, in my opinion. I mean, the guy has had a rough life. I mean, he brought up the fact that he wasn't really all that interested in wrestling and carrying on this family legacy of pro wrestling like all his cousins and his brothers and stuff want to. Uh, you know, this is something that came into him much later after he kind of ran with the wrong crowd, got in some trouble, things like that, and then decided to start getting into the pro wrestling scene. I believe he mentioned, was it the Usos that got him training or got him into it? Or he spent a lot yeah. of time in the backyard with the boys anyway. And they talked about yeah. doing, learning that moonsault that he does came about from jumping from a trampoline into a swimming pool in the backyard or something like that, that he would consistently yeah. do in order to be able to hit that spot properly. And just so much to unfold it in these times sitting down with Jacob fought too. I'm like, you know, you could have done 
two episodes of MLW Fusion of just this, I would have been a happy man. Yeah, absolutely. Just like you said, it was kind of neat. It didn't uh, it didn't pull the veil back to the kind of character that he is on TV. It was it it solidified that even more. And I mean, to set the stage, he's talking about the tough life and the streets of Oakland and all that stuff. And he's doing the interview. He's kind of sitting in an alley like it looks like a little concrete ledge where a loading trucks pull up or something. He's got a bottle of booze half finished and he's puffing darts the whole time. He's a real dude, man. Like, and he doesn't give a shit. Like he'll sit there and talk about his stuff. Very conversational guy. Um, was very interesting, brought some emotion into it, talked about some of the uh, rough stuff he's seen on the streets because, yeah, it sure sounds like he was up to some pretty bad stuff for a while there. And there were drive-by shootings and all kinds of stuff. He was going to jail and uh, screwing around his life and screwing up all the stuff that he was trying to accomplish in his life. So I think that's part of where wrestling came in too was that he needed to take a different path and, this was just fascinating too. I also didn't realize, like I knew he was from the, from the uh, uh, Samoan and, and Tongan uh, ancestry that we've seen so many modern wrestlers come from, but he's the son of the Tonga kid. That was, mm-hmm. I remember that that's from my era, the eighties of watching WWF. Uh, once WWF lost Superfly Snuka, they needed a guy like that. So they brought in the young guy, the Tonga kid. And he, continued the feud with piper you know like to uh to avenge superfly snooker so i that that's pretty fun to realize that's fatu's dad and uh this was just uh, such an interesting segment and like we've been talking about recently i love when shows do that give you a little personality profile upon the wrestler and you get to know the guy a little bit personally as well as professionally and uh not just watching his matches, but uh, hearing the guy talk about his life and uh, just adds a different uh, layer and a different level or some more color to the uh, to the performers there. And uh, this is a guy I've been curious about for a long time because there's not even all that much information online about Jacob Fatu. I get the impression he's kind of a more private guy, but here we go from, from his own lips uh, just furthering his uh his uh, reputation as a badass and uh, as a cool guy and i totally like this uh, were there three or two or three segments of this i, I was i was uh, glued to my screen very very interesting two for sure and i i don't know if they repeated one or if there was a third one it doesn't matter to me i just kept watching them i i've gone back and rewatched. And everything because i found it so fascinating like you say and again yeah i wish more of this was done where it doesn't feel like you're forcing a guy to try to be a certain person or talk a certain way this feels like a legit dude being like i had a troubled life i settled down learned how to kick shit in the ring and now i'm you know now i'm taking names who's signing up and like and that's how i felt coming out of this i'm like this does not worry me in the least about Jake Fatu moving forward. I think this is only going to put him over more with the MLW crowd. He's got his big fight coming up here. Uh, actually, you know, as we're recording tonight, it's actually Aaron as we speak. So yeah. against uh, Mods Kruger and, you know, all the darkness from Mods Kruger and his promos, and we'll talk about that in a bit too, has been interesting. But Jake Fatu has come across real and come across just as intimidating, I think, and scary when it comes down to it to the point where, this is going to be one hell of a fight and I'm looking forward to it. And this was the best way to build this thing up. For sure. And uh, you notice that he, uh, he didn't even really talk that much about his current situation in wrestling. He said, uh, you know, the black flag has been taken down and uh, Contra ain't around anymore, but uh, I still have unfinished business there. Hammerstone, I want my belt back and you and I are going to meet one of these days might not be today or tomorrow but i'm coming for you and i'm gonna get my belt back what more build up do you need really right like this this already has me hooked because the match last time was so anticipated and so good and now just with those small handful of words it's like okay good i'm so glad that the rematch is at least in the conversation of being made and uh I, god i can't wait for a fatu hammerstone too yeah, I can't wait either. It'll be a good one. Uh, so after the Jacob Fought 2 segment, which pretty much stole the show there, uh, we had a yes. video package. And 
the video package, like right now, we won't say what it is. It's a TV. It's a uh, hourglass. TikTok. Someone's coming. Again, pretty much everybody online was able to decipher what this meant right away as soon as this came on. I think they actually played it during the Azteca a week before and alluded yeah. to it. And it was pretty clear what this was going to be. But we'll get there because they actually say it later in the show. I got the notes, so we'll talk about them in a little bit. Uh, so after they played that little segment, which caught my attention, we finally get to hear from our good friend St. Laurent, fellow Canadian St. Laurent, finally getting on the TV there. It seems like they got bigger things in store for them than being on commentary every week to week. It sounds like maybe St. Laurent is going to be a pro wrestling manager down at ringside. He's got somebody, he said he's found the best pound for pound fighter in the entire world. And he's bringing him into MLW. And I keep thinking to myself, pound for pound fighter. Now it makes me start to go down the path of, has he gone after somebody who has like an MMA mixed martial arts, actual fighting background, or is this going to be a very large individual that he has found from the wrestling circuit? It leaves it open to debate. And I'm very curious to find out what is up the sleeves of Mr. St. Laurent. Yeah. And I was very curious about that too. For me, when somebody says pound for pound, the toughest fighter, I think a small guy, right? Because pound for pound kind of like evens up for, you know, the size that a guy might not have. I don't know. This is just speculation at this point, but very curious. And uh, it seems like there might be a couple of good names. I'm glad if MLW is getting a good reputation for guys to come in and do uh, do uh, segments or do spots or do one-offs uh, uh, for the company because it only benefits uh, us viewers and hopefully the company in general in the future. Well, speaking of somebody that they could end up getting a surprise in there, and I don't know if they just knew this was going to be in the works, but here's something. The WWE allowed the contract of Cesaro to expire. He has no release clause saying that he can't compete for 90 days. So Antonio Cesaro, or Claudio as he was known previously, is yeah. a free man now and able to show up wherever he desires. What if pound for pound, he was the man that St. Laurent decides to bring into MLW? I mean, I'm on board. I'm pretty much on board with ever, anything that man goes to do. I think he is pound for pound one of the best in-ring workers that they have around. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a guy of the stature of Cesaro, has a lot of options open to him. I mean, any company would want to work with him. It's whether they can afford him or not. But he, I don't think he fits in every major company around here either. But I think MLW would be probably the best fit for him. Can you imagine him going to Tony Khan's company and just being lost in the shuffle there, a great talent like that, and doing jobs for uh, uh, undeserving guys on TV like that would just be awful. But uh, MLW, he can get in there with some good guys. He doesn't have to do um, job matches or squash matches or anything like that. He can get in there and ha do a little program with someone that can handle it, you know, and uh, I, I would love it. But uh, again, time will tell, I guess, uh, with uh, without his no compete clause, we might find out sooner rather than later. I'm sure we will because, I mean, the time's uh, ticking on his time in the ring, I'm sure, too. At 40, 41 years old, I'm sure he's going to want to pick somewhere pretty quick to uh, get wrestling and get down there uh, right away because, I mean, again, that takes a toll on your body. And uh, as we were mentioned about King Muertes earlier in the show, it, it starts to take its toll, and he's not going to be able to do the things he once did in a few years' time. So get it in now while you still can and then adapt accordingly in order to keep your career fresh. Yeah, and so after uh, the whole bit with St. Laurent, we'll guess we'll find out uh, what he's got going on there pretty soon. I'm imagining Super Fight is when we're going to see that debut. I believe that is mentioned later on, and we'll get to that. Uh, up next, we've got an interesting matchup. We've got Akira Kwan, who we've both sang the praises of quite a bit on Hit Ring Respect Radio, taking on the judge, <coughs> EJ and Duka, who we, for other reasons, have sang the praises of here on Ring Respect Radio. And I think after seeing this match, I I'm going to stick to the same kind of praises. EJ and Duka looks like a star. He's got a great physique, a great look. He stands out of the crowd. He is still very, very green. And it is noticed in his work inside the ring. Um, I'm not knocking him. He, he can get there. He's very capable. He's a big boy. I think it's just one of those things of he's being exposed because they can't 
always protect the, the guy inside the ring. Uh, they got to get him in there with some of these guys. And I, I mean, I guess from my standpoint, I can see the greenness, but I hope that it'll adapt and get better. And I hope we get to see EJ and Duca grow because I do think that there is star quality in EJ and Duca, but Akira Kwan, man, awesome. Just everything he did inside that ring. I enjoyed it. I always enjoy it. I think it's great. And we got to hear him promo after this matchup for, but is this yeah. the first time? I think they even mentioned it. The first time Akira Kwan has got on a microphone and he wants another fight. He's calling anybody out. And then he specifically asked for Jake Fatu on top of it. Yeah. And how cool is this too? Because on one of our previous episodes, this was after a war chamber. I had seen on Twitter that Quan was saying uh, about MLW, they're telling me they don't have anything for me and that they'd look, it was kind of looking like they might just not use him after kind of folding up Contra. And you could feel his frustration in a few of those tweets. That's why it's so fun to see him have a match on all these episodes, using him as a job guy, which is fine, which is totally fine, but um, still coming out to the contra video and everything but he's still got a spot there and he's still working there and he's still pushing his name and his uh his style and everything and i'm glad to see this guy there because i think that's one of the cooler guys they have he's not flashy he doesn't win a whole bunch of matches he doesn't have belts and stuff like that but this is a guy that looks cool and has an excellent gimmick and uh which i don't think really even is that much of a gimmick but he's just uh tough guy, martial artist sort of guy. And uh, I think that there's a spot for him, whether it's uh, putting over uh, the talent that's higher on the card than him, or uh, I, I hope that he gets a little run. You know, I think he should be in there with the middleweight guys with uh, Meyer and Reed and all that, but maybe we'll see that at some point. But I just, I'm, I feel great for him that he's still in the mix because I could feel the frustration through Twitter that he was having that, thinking, am I going to get dropped from this company now that there's no contra, they don't have a spot for me, but he's good and he can uh, get a good match out of, out of uh, other wrestlers on the roster. So for me, this is a win-win situation. I'm glad Quan is still around. Yeah, well, here's a thought. Maybe he needs the ring respect bump here. Uh, maybe we need to reach out to our yeah. good friend Akira Quan, get him on the show, and watch yeah. his star rise just like our good friend Bud Heavy did that. Uh, after yeah. last year being on ring respect. So Kiro Kwan, consider this your call out, man. We're going to be reaching out to you. You're going to be hearing from the video bros very soon. And hopefully you'd be interested in joining us on an upcoming episode of ring respect. That'd Radio. be awesome. I yeah, really I'd think like it would be. But speaking of awesome, we did get to see Jacob Paw too come out shortly after that for the first time since the war chamber, speaking of war chamber, and he beat the shit out of our good buddy Akira Kwan there. I mean, he, he laid him in hard. He put him through that table. Man, Akira Kwan looked worse for wear after this one was said and done. And, and Duka had already put him through hell too, man. That finisher that he did, that sort of uh, front choke slam thing, man, the bump on that just looked absolutely brutal, man. Like, I, I don't know how you can protect yourself from that. I think it just hurts tremendously. And then Man, Fatu working him over and the splash through the table. Like, whoo, he must have been sore that night and the next day. Yeah, I feel bad for the guy, but man, he took it, took it like a pro, <laughs> that's for sure. So good on you, Kiro yeah. Kwan, and great spot yeah. overall. I mean, it's a nice win for EJ and Duca. I mean, we kind of trailed off from EJ for a bit there, but again, he looks like a star. It was kept nice and short so that he looks really dominant and strong in the process, but Akira Kwan so got to get some of his shit in there as well, too. Um, and Duca will grow. I really do believe in Duca will grow. I think he wants to grow. He <clears> wants to learn more. And the best part is, is that physique and that look just scream superstar. So as he starts to adapt that in-ring stuff to match that look, I think MLW's got a prize on their hands. I think so, too. And there was one other thing I wanted to say about Nduka, just to add to your point there, too, is that in the in the old days, before the internet and all that, I think a uh, federation such as MLW that had a potentially big star like EJ Nduka could keep the guy hidden for a bit while they trained him. They would get him working with a bunch of their experienced wrestlers and some other trainers before he got on TV so that he had some 
uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some better experience by the time he got on TV. But nowadays, you can't really protect guys so well. The fans know uh, that where each wrestler is. And uh, I, now you just see people getting developed on TV. So that it's just a little difference of the business nowadays. You have to get your guy out there and get him, get the fans familiar with him, get a few uh, uh, asses in seats in the arenas that want to see him. And uh, they're just trying to bring the rest up as you go. But you can start building the guy's brand before he's actually uh, capable of having an excellent match sort of thing. And I think that's what they're going to do with Enduka too, have him smash some dudes, use his huge size and power to, to get over. And I, I think it is getting over. I think it will get over, but uh, he's a work in progress. I, I, I think he'll do good. He was a professional athlete and a football player and all that. He'll pick this up too, no problem. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I mean, I think I, I want to see the guy do well. I think the chatter that you're talking about, like getting the buzz going about him, that has worked excellent. He has helped get himself out there. People are taking notice because he stands out like a sore thumb. He, again, like he's got that million dollar smile. He's got that. He's a good looking dude. He's, you know, fit as fuck. Like, I mean, this guy has got it all. So all you got to do, develop that in ring. And man, the, the world will be talking about EJ and Duke in a year's time. I strongly believe in that. Uh, uh, moving on from there, we're going to go back to talking about that promo that we saw earlier in the night or that video package that we saw. The reveal was Killer Cross. Obviously, this is a big return that we got coming up at MLW Presents Super Fight. They mentioned there's going to be a lot of big debuts, a lot of big returns. And a lot of uh, legends coming back as well, too. And we know that some of the legends coming back, uh, we got Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. We've got, um, the, pardon me, I know that there's more. Gan Grail has taken on Big Beef Gnarls Garvin in a matchup. Uh, we've got, I believe, Ricky Morton is there, if I'm not mistaken, as well, too, competing and everything. Uh, this It's huge. And then on top of it, Killer Cross. Hot off his uh, release from the WWE, uh, where they... Apparently wanted to make him look like something out of Mad Max back in 1980. Uh, did not work out there, but he's going to work out just fine on the MLW circuit. I believe that he's been there before. He knows the place. I think he's going to come back with a huge bang. But I've also been seeing these videos online, and I'm not going to go too deep into them, but I believe there might be some link up there with the Rotunda family at some point, whether that crosses over into MLW or somewhere on the Indies. We'll wait and see. But I think uh, Killer Cross has got a... Uh, phone call into good old Wyndham Rotunda there that's uh, still lurking in the in the shadows somewhere but yeah looking forward to Killer Cross debut at Super Fight uh, again that'll be taped for MLW uh, Fusion uh, matches down the road I can't wait till that one airs I'm really looking forward to the return of Killer Cross to MLW personally oh what a what a return to uh, the timing and what a great guy to get and and a lot of people didn't know who Killer Cross was until he went to WWE as Carrion Cross and all that stuff. But this guy's been pumping the indies for a long time, uh, including uh, AAA and some other things. This guy's been all over the place, worked with a ton of different wrestlers and a ton of different styles. Good stuff, man. And, and if he's getting stifled in the in the big corporate uh, wrestling world, then good. Let, let him come back down to where he's more comfortable. I think Killer Cross is an excellent talent. He's got an awesome look. He's huge. He's scary. He's a pretty decent wrestler and a good promo. Perfect, man. And a great place for him, too. MLW, he fits there. There's there's guys he can work with there that, that he can have good programs with. So I'm tremendously excited to... I'm not sure whether he'll be on the heel or baby face side. I'm trying to like think of some uh, potential dream matchup sort of thing. But again, I, I don't even want to look into the future. I just want to see what they have for him. And I, I'm going to watch it and enjoy it. Question is, does his wife come along with him and start to enter uh, down to the ring with him? Not only that, the potential to enter the uh, MLW featherweight division as well, too. I mean, there is a lot yeah. of great potential in the signing of Killer Cross to MLW. Yeah, I was also wondering if Scarlett would be along for various reasons to it. They look great together and they're a great package. So I say use them, but we'll see what happens. For sure we will. And that's coming up on February 26th. So this uh, 
Saturday, I believe, or to, it's either Friday or Saturday. I can't remember. But anyway, Super Fight taping this weekend, and then the matches will start to release as Fusion gets rolled out on to YouTube. But speaking of, let's get back to the episode 132 here. Right after we got that announcement, we get a promo from 5150. They are now as well the IWA Tag Team Champions as well as the MLW Tag Team Champions. Good on you, 5150. Um, they've been an excellent team. I like the look. I think they the two of them complement each other extremely well with their in-ring work and stuff like that. Slice Boogie is such a talent. I, I really like this dude. I think his in-ring work is phenomenal. Um, I think it's, you know, I mean, as a tag team, I like that it's keeping that that way because I think this is going to work wonders for the two of them for a long time to come. And I believe that they're both young, the great future ahead of them. And they're cutting this promo about the uh, taking on Los Parks. They're also saying they're dedicating it to uh, Conan, who's out with surgery. They want to fight for Conan, even though he can't be there with them at next week's matchup. Uh, again, another great promo from 5150. Uh, this one probably even more bogged down and a little bit more realistic feeling from the two. They weren't over the top here. They were talking about just the, the love of Conan and what he's done for them and doing this for him kind of thing. I thought this was a nice change of pace promo wise for them. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And bringing it some reality into their only strengths and promos. I think they, they're not uh, working a baby face program, but in fact, a, a wrestling figure, their manager, Conan, a guy that we all know and everything is in some uh, medical difficulties, got his surgeries coming up and stuff. So we feel for him and we want him to recover and be a hundred percent after that. And you had to feel it from 51 52. And uh, these guys are cool. They know how to cut a good promo. I love their in-ring work. We're going to talk about them a little bit more on this next episode we're going to cover. So I'll leave that for then, but uh, 51 50 doing some great stuff. And uh, they're really doing the, uh, doing the MLW tag team championship proud. Yeah, they really are. And, uh, you know, I can't wait to talk more about them in a little bit here. But we got to go down to our main event of the night from episode 132. It is the Falls Count Anywhere Brawl, No DQ, whatever they're calling it this week, match between Alexander Hammerstone and Pagano for the MLW Heavyweight Championship. Uh, as always, before the championship match, they do a little video package where they show all the former MLW heavyweight champions throughout history. Always a nice little package to be able to see, to see the lineage of the title and to realize that as long as MLW has been along, that is not a very long package of guys there. That is a who's who of people that have held the MLW championship. So this is uh, going to be a big opportunity for Pergano being able to go in there and fight for what I would consider to be a pre very prestigious championship in pro wrestling. And my favorite thing about that uh, historical package of the champions is just that Mike Awesome was champion of MLW back in the early 2000s. What a, what a worthy champion. I, I love watching his shit, man, and I would like to see much more of his MLW stuff. I got to go back there and watch more of that. He, he was a, a one-of-a-kind talent for sure. Yeah, he really was, and it was great to see them be able to be up there every single time. Um, yeah, so nice little video packages that starts out. We know that the the history between Pagano and Hammerstone started with the Azteca uh, matches. There was a lot between these two guys going on. Um, Cesar Duran really wants this title taken off of Hammerstone. This was mostly just not my cup of tea, Pop Smokes. Like, there was a lot of brutal hits from the guys. There was the one spot that stood out, even though I don't really care for it, was those sticks in the top of Pagano's head it was kind yeah. of sick looking. It was interesting because I haven't seen that exact spot a thousand times recently, despite most of the stuff in this match kind of falling into that. Okay, I've seen guys through trash cans. I've seen guys getting hit with chairs and tables and all that kind of stuff. That was the one standout when it comes to the weapons use in this matchup. When these two guys locked up when they actually do some back and forth hitting and wrestling type moves that's what i wanted to see i really think i could have enjoyed a regular one-on-one -on -one match with hammerstone and pagano on this show i think again for this this to me went a little bit too long for being a hardcore you know beat the hell out of a guy with weapons type match it really held a lot of the time slot on this one Hammerstone taking the win. Good for him. Um, he gets that win under his belt. Uh, another successful title defense. But again, just the match itself wasn't my cup of tea. I don't know what your thoughts are, Papa Smokes. I'll turn it over to you on that one. 
No, I agree with you 100%. I'm not a huge uh, hardcore deathmatch kind of guy. I, I like it in small doses or if there's one match, you know, uh, that, a, that a company does throughout a few months, you know, if there's a big feud, they have a hardcore blow-off match. That, to me, makes sense. But when you have multiple cards where all the matches are hardcore, it's just too much. It's ridiculous. But anyway, for this particular match, yeah, yeah. Uh, I always like Hammerstone stuff. He's pretty good and everything. Pagano was good, but this whole match with the entrances and everything was 24 minutes long, and that, that's just too long. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they didn't have much else or they didn't have some an extra match for these tapings or whatever, so they let this one go along. But uh, too long, too much uh, silliness outside the ring. And the, the, you mentioned those sticks getting stuck in Pagano's head, which is kind of, kind of different, kind of a little bit funny. But then you saw Hammerstone trying to pull them out. He yeah. couldn't pull them out. Yeah. He knew he jammed them in there pretty good. That kind of had me wincing when he, you could see him trying to pull them out and he couldn't yank them out. <laughs> good God, man. How how hard did you jam those in his forehead? <laughs> yeah, it, it was definitely a sick spot. And again, like we were talking before the show went on the air about like some of the legends that have done spots like that before. I mean, again, we're not 100% against it. It's just that they're, I guess in this case, they it seemed like we had already seen Pagano and Hammer back and forth with hardcore this and no DQ that kind of thing because that's what most of Azteca ended up being for the for the most part. Um, so this felt like they didn't have the kind of payoff that we were talking about and when we've seen so much of it in recent history uh, memory with all the Azteca stuff. I felt this is the show where we needed to have kind of more of a pure wrestling night, and then we ended up with a no DQ matchup as the main event. Fell a little flat yeah. for me personally, is all. Yeah, uh, same with me. I, I think we can move on from this. Hammerstone retains uh, and uh, Pagano goes back to Mexico or uh, until his next MLW appearance, I suppose, but probably uh, increased the value of his name just on these couple of MLW uh, performances in itself. So he's happy about it too. Yeah, I mean, we know who he is now. Didn't know before, so yeah. I mean, he's done done that. He made an impact enough to let people know who he is. Good for him. Um, then that's the show. Ah, just kidding. Um, no, that wasn't the show, actually. After that, we were expecting a interview uh, with Hammerstone in the ring. Richard Holiday down at ringside. Alicia Toot's going to interview Hammerstone. And what do you know, Papa Smokes? The heel turn happens. Alicia nutsacks Hammerstone right in the middle of the ring there. Takes him to Dick Kick City on that one. And uh, then Richard Holiday goes in for the kill on Hammerstone. Alicia and Holiday working together. They work over Hammerstone and everybody is unhappy. Although I kind of thought to myself as I saw this, and I'm remembering an episode of Ring Respect Radio where there was a promo after they found out that Hammer was going to defend against Holiday for the title. And we were saying that it was really goofy in the way it was presented. And I said, it almost felt to me like they were foreshadowing a holiday heel turn and that he'll turn on Hammerstone in the exact fashion that he just described. And here you go. It happens right in the ring. I couldn't stop thinking about it when that happened. I thought it was quite entertaining. Yeah, that. And if you want to bring up uh, predictions from old episodes to go even further back to when uh, Hammerstone and that two first started their little backstage kind of a, uh, uh, meanderings there and I said Bunsen you can cut the sexual tension between these two with a knife <laughs> hey and they, that was from the very beginning my yeah. god now look at them eh? making out wildly in the ring such a sexy couple yeah they really were <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm on to I'm on to something here Bob and Smokes I'm pretty sure the yeah. holiday is just her guy when she's in the US when she comes over to Canada I got my theories that she has her eyes on a little Spencer Love over at Love Wrestling, and I'm bound to prove it. I'm going to send Holiday the proof if I can get it that your girl Alicia Toot and Spencer Love are in cahoots behind your back. Holiday, be warned. I will find the proof. Scandalous, Munson. Scandalous. 
<laughs> Who's the journalist now? <laughs> this guy. <laughs> anyway, that was the episode that is 132. Overall, decent episode. The heel turn was very impactful. Uh, even if the final match wasn't quite as impactful, the uh, heel turn at the end was great. Looking forward to this from Richard Holiday. We've been saying it for a long time. The guy can talk. The guy can wrestle. He just needs that angle. You said it earlier in the show, Papa Smokes. Is this that angle finally that once he starts to get his hands on Alexander Hammerstone? Yeah, for sure it is too. And and I love the way MLW takes their time with some of these things too. I mean, how long has him and a twos thing been brewing? Like the better part of a year for sure, right? Like where they've been teasing it. They're so patient, and I love that because then by the time they get to it, you've almost forgotten about it a little bit, right? Like, very, very clever. And, uh, yeah, th- this episode wasn't uh, completely exciting, but the climax at the end really, really furthered a lot of stuff, really got the tongues wagging and uh, they all, everybody on the Internet talking. And as you can see, uh, you know, speaking of social media and such, Holiday in a two really pumping it, making lots of videos on their own time. Just the, that sickening, annoying couple that you that you really hate to see with their public displays of affection all the time. I think this is going to be a hot program, and I, I, I have the feeling they're both going to do good in it. I want Holiday to succeed, and, and like we said, he needed that angle and everything. This is his moment, and I want him to get over big time. Yeah, and I think he will. I think he fits the heel role better too like is playing the baby oh, yeah. face at the side of hammerstone was was draining i mean let, let's admit it we were getting tired of it we were getting tired of the silliness i'm glad we're past that and i'm on board with this i want to watch this version of richard holiday he just oozes with this like just this arrogance that you know that is been brewing inside of him ready to come out we're gonna to get to talk about it more with episode 133 coming up here too this is a side of Richard Holiday I want to see. We already talked about earlier in the night how he performed so well inside the ring. Hammerstone better watch out. I mean, this Richard Holiday might have been screwed in that match earlier in the night with the distraction, but a focused Richard Holiday with Alicia two in his corner could become a very big threat, if not the one to maybe overcome Hammerstone for that championship. Yeah, and can y'all just ask you, Munson? Can you see Holiday as champion, like? It almost seems like he needs a few more big matches under his belt, but I could totally see him carrying the belt for a little while at least, right? Like maybe not a year-long run or something like that, but I could see, uh, I think he's ready to do some uh, top-of-the-card type action. And uh, like I say, this is his big chance. And with his buddy Hammerstone, uh, these guys know each other. They have an uh, opportunity to make some magic here. That, and uh, I'm so excited and uh, uh, anticipating this match somewhere down the line in the future. I don't think they've said when it's occurring yet, have they? But uh, yeah. But you, you do start to wonder about the lingering idea that Davey Richards better watch his back come super fight because yeah. I have a funny feeling that Holiday does not want Hammerstone to lose that championship, despite what Cesar Duran is wanting. But we'll, find, we'll find out soon enough as those matches start to happen, though, Papa Smokes. So that's 132 in the bag. We're going to talk now about MLW Fusion episode 133, which appeared last Thursday night on YouTube. Uh, we started this one off in a different fashion, and this was something I kind of liked. We went straight down to ringside with Joe Dabrowski and Rich Bokini. Dabrowski says he's got a uh, an interview lined up, and there, Calvin Tankman, who has been missing for quite some time. Apparently, uh, Alex Kane had his people uh, have Tankman basically arrested. Uh, there was a restraining order put against Tankman, keeping him away from Alex Kane, and the sponsorship deals from Crybaby Tank, or Crybaby yeah. Calvin, have been yeah. quite entertaining for me. I love where this has been going. Um, Alex Kane and Mr. Thomas come out. Calvin managed to swing in, get a punch on Alex Kane before they're separated completely, uh, keeping these two apart again. This this has been fun. I and, and fun in a I believe these two disliking each other sort of way. I believe all the things that Kane would go about to really just get under the skin of Calvin Tankman like he has, putting restraining orders against him, making sure that he can't be in the same arenas as him and everything. It makes Kane look like a total, like just 
we, I, I, I don't want to say piece of shit, but for a lack of better words, it seems like he's a real piece of shit human being that would do these things. And at the same time, Calvin Tankman is being shown as a bit of a hothead too. He allows Kane to get under his skin. He allows them to get to him and he wants to swing those punches and do those things that allow Alex Kane to keep Calvin Tankman at arm's reach at all times so that he knows what's in there for him. He knows how to keep away from him. And it allows us to have that separation long enough that we don't have to immediately have Tankman in the ring with Alex Kane and have that payoff within a month of this thing starting. Yeah, absolutely. And that speaks to uh, the patience of MLW booking that we just were talking about a few minutes ago is keeping these guys apart, having them interact, but keeping them physically apart. And, uh, you say Alex Kane's acting like a piece of shit, and that's true too, but you got to remember he's protecting his championship all the time, right? Like this is a classic heel move is that he, he's not going to say it, but he's scared of his number one contender, so he's going to use by hook or by crook any method he can think of to keep that guy physically away from him. no matches, no title shots, no nothing but just give him cheap shots every now and again, keep him pissed off, but uh, never let him uh, get his one up and so on you. So, uh, uh, you know, obviously we're probably going to see this uh, open weight championship match happen at some point. But again, I like the patience of court Bauer and his bookers that just keep the two apart for a while and keep that tension building, keep it at a low boil for a while. Then there will be a show in the future where it comes up perfect. Let's put these two against each other and let them go wild in the ring. Yeah, I'm I'm loving it. I like all the guys involved. I mean, especially like Tankman and Kane are just fantastic. They're in great in-ring yeah. workers. They both can talk extremely well. I mean, I've become big fans of them without having to see a ton of matches even uh, just from how they conduct themselves. I really enjoy it. I think this feud is going perfectly well. Kane is superb. What a talent. I mean, his in-ring work is fantastic. He works a microphone perfectly. Just some of those smug looks on his face sometimes. I think I've said it a million times, like just watch more Alex Kane because Alex Kane to me is star quality in every sense of the word. I think this guy should be at the top of professional wrestling. I am a big Alex Kane fan and I'm not afraid to admit it because Alex Kane kicks some serious ass. Yeah, absolutely right. And uh, this is going to be good. I can't wait for the payoff of this feud and, uh, who knows, maybe we'll see Tankman have a run at that uh, open weight championship too. And uh, imagine him with the belt too. He'd be another guy pretty hard to unseat. Yeah, really would. At least they're uh, keeping that belt amongst the big boys here, amongst the uh, top stars in MLW as well too. That title has got quite the bit of prestige being that only one man had held it up until Alex Kane and nobody has ever won it from defeating the guy who has it at this point in time so a lot of prestige behind the national open weight championship and i'm looking forward to that payoff speaking of payoffs hey anytime this man is in the ring it is a payoff for me we get davy richards match on mlw always the top quality match when i see this guy in the ring we were talking before this one on the air i think this guy is on a whole different level when it comes to his mat game and taking on ach who we know can put on a good show ach handles himself well inside that ring a good professional he's been around a long time And this was exactly that. I thought, uh, again, I still think that I've seen some better Davey Richards matches, ones that I liked a little bit more than this. But this one, still a lot of great Matt wrestling, as you expect to see in a Davey Richards match. Quality from both him and ACH, great selling. Uh, There was that really, I mean, you got to say, I mean, the spot with uh, ACH running up the ramp over the top rope into the cutter was nailed perfectly. It was a nice pop. The crowd loved it. I thought it was cool at the same time. And for a split second there, I'm like, shit, are they going to have ACH put the first win over Davey Richards? Like Davey Richards pulling his first loss in MLW here in Texas. I mean, ACH, he's the hometown boy at this point. I had yeah. started to wonder when he went up for that frog splash and, and nailed it at uh, two and a half, that was a false finish that worked for me and it works really well. Yeah. And if you do them right, they do work good. They'll pop the entire crowd, but yeah, to the, to your point with this match, uh, uh, I don't think it was a huge surprise, you know, wondering who was going to go over in this match, but ACH is one of those uh, competitors that even if you kind of suspect that he's going to do the job, 
he works good in the ring, man. And you, then he, it can create uncertainty in your mind as to whether he's going to go down for the count or not. And, uh, they're very clever in laying out these matches in MLW. Sometimes, uh, you don't see it on the big channels anymore. The, the logistics of when to do your two counts and when to do your false finishes and et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, for me, this was a match of, uh, uh, even though it's the second episode after uh, Azteca Underground segment, this was MLW getting back to an MLW match. You know what I mean? A sports style match where uh, uh, you watch the guys kind of shoot grapple for a little bit for a while, you know, like both those guys are accomplished grapplers. You know that they're probably just saying, Hey, let's just wrestle for a little bit at the beginning Neither of us uh, is going to get the advantage so much, but let's just do some stuff because they're pros and they can do that. We've watched uh, various wrestlers do that over the past years and such. Brian Danielson, a big uh, com- a big uh, supporter of that kind of style. Hey, let's just wrestle for a bit at the beginning and uh, take the first four, five, six minutes and just grapple for a while. I like this, but... Uh, you kind of knew what was going to happen in this. Richards has got the big championship match against Hammerstone coming up. He needs a couple of convincing wins just to get him in the fans' minds as the number one contender sort of thing. And uh, he'll be a stiff challenge for Hammerstone, especially after the fans have seen him pin a very game opponent in the ACH. Yeah, and I mean, you could legitimately see Richards, uh, if he doesn't get screwed, beating Alexander Hammerstone for the MLW Championship. So there is that uncertainty that could they could they do it? Like, would they go that direction? Maybe, maybe it's not Davey Richards who gets screwed. Maybe Hammerstone gets screwed and Davey Richards becomes the new champion and Hammerstone's left feuding with Holiday with no belt around his waist. We don't know. And that's what's great about MLW and you say about the way they choose to book things is that uncertainty and that unknown allows us to be invested in it. And I am invested in this. I'm glad it's happening. Davey Richards gets on the mic after his big win here after tapping out ACH, gives props to ACH saying only in Texas could they build him as strong and tough as this guy everything. So a nice nod to his opponent and everything. And he thanks him. Uh, So then he has the ring all to himself talking about Hammerstone, about how he's been on the hunt. (laughs) Well, first of all, he brings up his missing opera cup. Somebody attacked him during Azteca underground. His opera cup has been stolen. We haven't found out who's behind that just yet. Uh, But then he goes on to Hammerstone. I'm wondering. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was just going to say, I'm wondering what's going on with that. And I wonder if that little angle is going to play into the championship match with Hammerstone about the uh, missing Opera Cup, too. I don't know. I can't really speculate as to what, where they're going with that. But uh, will that somehow fit into the title match? We'll see, I guess. Good. And it also makes me wonder if, like, could it be Alex Kane and Mr. Thomas behind it? You know, Alex Kane did want into the Opera Cup initially and didn't get his o- chance even though he was an alternate that was sitting at the sidelines yes he did end up getting the national open weight championship but could it find out after super fight alex kane was behind this thing and now he has the opera cup what if he provoked davy richards enough to put that opera cup on the in a match against it like defend the honor of that opera cup against me one-on-one and i'll put my national open weight championship on the line and we get a quality match between those two and a very unique stipulation Interesting, months and uh, your your booking mind is getting very uh, developed. I like it. <laughs> I've had a lot of time on my hands lately, so. <laughs> but uh, yeah, hopefully we'll get to find out more of that unfolding as a uh, super fight happens this weekend. Uh, from there, we got a promo from Mods Kruger. This one very dark sounding, talking about how uh, wondering if Fatu has ever seen his blood run and how like tons of blood will run and stuff. He's talking about his, uh, his darkness and all this kind of stuff. They did do the voice modulation on Kruger again. I think Kruger has a fantastically deep, dark voice as it is that they don't need the modulation that they put over top of his voice here. It was a little bit more clear. And I think maybe it's because mods Kruger is clued in a little bit too, to how to, 
use that modulation and make it sound really well. I, I think maybe enunciate some of his words strongly enough that it comes through on the modulation. Uh, so I thought this one was a little better. I thought it was definitely better with the modulation. As always, I, I don't mind these promos from Mads, Mods Kruger to begin with. I think that he can speak very well. I think he's a very intimidating individual, and I'm very much looking forward to the fight against Jacob Fatu coming up. Me too. Uh, Mods Kruger is one of my guilty pleasures in MLW. It's not the kind of uh, character I would normally get into, but I like the way the guy's doing it. He's got the size and the look. Uh, I like his outfit. I like his mask and everything. And uh, and uh, he's devastating in the ring. And whether there's still a black flag of Contra or not, you have this maniac monster running wild in your company and he's uh, completely destructive and completely dangerous and he still I like that they're continuing the feud with Fa too that the the two guys hate each other and they still have unfinished business highly looking forward to this match I also liked Mods's match in Azteca against uh, Bestia say 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 too yes even yes. though it was a, a even though it was a, kind of a garbage hardcore match i still i like both those guys and i think they did a good job in this uh kruger's a, kind of an acquired taste but I, I like his stuff man he's a very scary character he harkens back to um previous eras in wrestling when you weren't trying to be the cool guy heel that everybody liked you were trying to be the scary guy that people reviled and hated and were afraid of so uh, Kruger's totally over with me, man, and I'm I'm very looking forward to uh, this next episode of Fusion to watch uh, him against Fatu. What's going to happen? Will it actually get settled? Who's the baby face? Who's the heel? I I mean, we kind of know this, I guess, but um, it's just got all kinds of questions in this feud, and I like it. Two huge guys let them smash each other to bits on TV, and we can just enjoy every bit of it. Yeah, it's going to be fantastic. And I'm glad you brought up the Bastia Say 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 part. Uh, I, that was one of the things I kind of forgot to mention was Bastia Say 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 and Mecha Wolf actually getting the opportunity to wrestle yeah. in MLW individually. Uh, they are also the NWA tag team champions. They've been tag team together for quite some time. Right. And they actually are a really strong tag team. I love their work as a tag team. They actually do a lot of traditional tag team styles and everything like that. Um, I think they're a couple of really cool wrestlers and I think, uh, think the world of them. I hope only the best for them. And I was glad to see them both get their opportunity in MLW. And I'd love to even see them take on 5150 in an MLW ring. That would be a kind of an interesting uh, turn of events and a great match to see down the road as well, too. Very much so. Uh, from there, speaking of programs, I think uh, we had more promos. Yes, we had St. Laurent was in uh, Cesar Duran's office talking about his pound for pound best fighter. Uh, Duran seems very pleased with what uh, St. Laurent's bringing to MLW and uh, proposes a trios match because we see a lot more trios matches in MLW these days uh, with the crossover from uh, AAA and Azteca. Uh, so we're going to get a triple threat, or sorry, trios match, sorry, not triple threat match. Uh, that will include uh, the debut of the new guy bringing in by St. Laurent. So I'm kind of curious to find out who this is. I would imagine, again, this is going to be something going down at Super Fight. But then they're interrupted by Myron Reed, who we've been not seeing on TV as of late. It's been a little while since we saw him, the young goat he comes in. He wants his rematch for his middleweight championship. Finally, uh, we've seen this defended only once, I believe, since it was won. Tajiri defended it over in All Japan Pro Wrestling in a very interesting match that was taped there for MLW at the same time. I, I had almost kind of forgot that Tajiri was the champion because they haven't really done a whole lot with this going forward. So this got brought up and I was like, okay, I, I'm on board with seeing Tajiri versus Reed for that title. And then it goes into a triple threat multi-man match because why not? That seems to be the way with a lot of the MLW stuff lately. Uh, so we're going to get a another mystery man because we got so many mystery men coming in to fight. Uh, it's the night of mystery men coming up this weekend. So we are going to have Tajiri versus Myron Reed versus a mystery opponent. I often wonder when was this segment filmed? Was that mystery opponent supposed to be Leo Rush until he picked up another injury and will not be able to perform? As far as I know, I don't know the extent of the injury. And do they have a really strong backup plan for this match? Yeah, I wonder too. And and when you see uh, 
matches booked with mystery men, you, you know that it's probably not the Federation trying to trick the fans. It's they don't have a guy yet, or they had a guy and it's not working out. So who knows? I mean, uh, yeah, I'm sure it was going to be Leo Rush because they were starting to uh, uh, tease that he was coming by name and everything. They had a little video uh, thing pumping that uh, Rush was coming back. Didn't he just retire again like a month or two <laughs> yeah. ago? But uh, <laughs> I'm not going to complain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to complain. I actually like his stuff. I like his in-ring mm-hmm. stuff. And he's a, he's a good slimy heel, but... Uh, yeah, I also agree with you. They need to get that middleweight title back in rotation, get it back to, I don't want to say it this way, but bring it back to the States and, and get get it being defended on your TV and uh, get some of your uh, uh, middleweight competitors on the roster involved in this, such as the Leo Rushes and uh, who are we bringing up before that would be a good uh, – addition to the middleweight roster. There's a few guys that could get in there and uh, including a bunch of those luchadors that they're pushing to Aramis and Ares and all those guys could get involved in this scene too. And, uh, and uh, yeah, give Myron the young goat, his shot back at a, at the belt that he held proudly for so long, but just let's, let's get it back on TV and, and back into circulation because uh, it's very popular, though those middleweight or lighter weight matches are what a lot of the fans like these days because you can get your 480 splashes and your hurricanas and your flying moves all over the place, and uh, it'll bring viewers to MLW. But let's get it back in circulation. Yeah, the other one I kind of want pondered a little bit for the mystery man here, and maybe it is a full on mystery man this time, is. They did say that Will Osprey was on his way to MLW. I thought it was originally planned for January, but we know that didn't happen as far as like as far as I know. There was no talk of it. I haven't heard any reason why Osprey wouldn't be coming in uh, for a little while. So it could be Osprey. That's another thought. I mean, he kind of fits that middleweight to, uh, moment, and you know he's he's got enough of a name status on the scene that I believe that that would make for a massive pop uh, when they go into Charlotte if Osprey were to show up at the show to be a part of that matchup. Uh, it would add definitely a different element to the match as well, too. I mean, Osprey's style is nothing like Reed's or Tajiri's at the same time. I think that we'd it'd be interesting. It'll be a multi-man match, though, Pop Smokes. We know what we think of those sometimes. I think I would have uh, a little more on board with Reed versus Tajiri 101. I would have been pretty okay with seeing that one-on-one matchup and maybe given Myron go his moment to beat a legend like Tajiri inside that ring clean and go over big time as the, as the middleweight champion for that would be the third time I believe. Yeah, that's, I think that's the good choice. Put it on Reed and then start to work on a, a roster opponents of opponents for him to defend against whatever your plan is booking wise for the next champion. Don't worry about it. Great. Have Reed uh, is quite adept, is, is quite capable of handling the champion's job. Put him on tour and give him a, a, a handful of good opponents. And uh, you got to raise the stake of this championship as well, because it just isn't getting defended on TV so much. Same with the open weight belt. Really, I'd like to see Alex Kane defend that title a bit more. What I think maybe or what would be my suggestion for them to do is make one of those two titles kind of like a TV title and have it defended. If not every single week on TV, I realize it's kind of difficult with uh, tapings in different cities and all that, but have it regularly defended on TV. That way the fans can kind of like, uh, uh, you know, attach themselves to that championship and the guys surrounding that. Because we don't really see very many championship matches either. I mean, have we seen Hammerstone have two matches since he won that belt last year or something? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Logano and maybe maybe somebody else. I can't remember now, but uh, I just I think they should have more championship matches on TV. Make that open weight or the middleweight championship more of a TV-based uh, belt. Yeah, especially like with the middleweight championship, if you could do like a semi-monthly thing, maybe Myron Reed is your champion. He comes out, he's reaching out to the local talent. Here's your opportunity to be on 
our program, come on out here, give me the fight of your life. And you could have a bit of back and forth competitiveness, but have Myron Reed going over in decent fashion against guys. I mean, that's when you start to be able to utilize your, your Robert Martyrs of the world and guys like that, that, that work in a local town that have no problem going out there, giving Reed a, uh, you know, a quality match inside that ring and then being able to put him over and make him look like an absolute superstar as the middleweight champion of MLW and really bring a lot of life back to that belt. I'd, I'd love to see it. I think you're onto a great thing there, Papa Smokes. Uh, speaking of great things, uh, the next segment is brought to you by Crybaby Kelvin, the sponsorship. <laughs> this was too funny. The reading of this, again, continuing on with just how much Alex Kane is trying to get out of the skin of Calvin Tankman. I believe they made a shirt of this too, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Like they went all out with this crybaby Calvin thing. It's this is comedy that I can be okay with because it's not insulting. It's it's insulting to Calvin Tankman, but it works in the sense that they're doing it to get under his skin. And it's not too goofy where it's taking up too much TV time. They're forcing, they pay, they make it seem like Kane spends all this money to have this sponsorship spot for Crybaby Kelvin on the MLW program. And the announcers are having to read through this. And I was chuckling. This is comedy done right for me. I can get behind it. I I love this. This was fun. Because he's trolling the announcers at the same time, too, and yeah. Bikini saying, do I have to read this? Like, Because it's just totally putting down a guy on their roster, too. And I, I love this. This is comedy well done, well placed. It's logical because these guys don't like each other. You know they're going to mock each other. And uh, genius. I love it. And I want a Cry Baby Calvin t-shirt badly. Yeah, I think we should invest. <laughs> I think that would be fantastic. So, uh, speaking of fantastic pop of smokes, the next segment is a matchup plus a video package. And I'm not going to complain about either of them. I mean, we can nitpick them, but I'm never going to nitpick anything that involves our good friend Bud fucking heavy, man. Bud fucking heavy yeah. back on TV. That a boy. Uh, so we got big beef Gnarls Garvin back into the picture, and he's got this video package out in the MLW parking lot. We got some big belly beer drinking guy out there with him and Norris Garvin's talking about wanting to beat up guys and drink beers. And that's all he's about. And he's going to grab himself a Bud Light out of the back of the truck and who should be lounging and sleeping in the back of the truck. No other than our good pal, Bud heavy and Norris Garvin brings up the fact that he, you know, or no, sorry, but heavy brings up the fact that they fought each other already. Cause Norris looked like he wanted to take another crack at him. And then he said, well, what are we going to do about this? Well, let's drink beer. So now we got a beer drinking, fun loving tag team of Gnarls Garvin, Big Beef and Bud fucking Heavy. So we got now we've got what uh, Bud Beef or Big Heavy is the tag team here. We could go a lot yeah. of different directions, uh, but this is an interesting pairing. I thought the outside segment, it was goofy, but it's perfect for our Bud. I thought it was fantastic for him. Uh, Gnarls Garvin is a very interesting individual, uh, to say the least. Uh, I, he's white trash wonderful. How can he not be interesting? Uh, the only problem I saw was they take it on the Saito brothers, who are a tag team, bring it, bring it brought in from All Japan Pro Wrestling. And I'm thinking, you know, they're debuting and talking about the Saito brothers being this top quality tag team. This doesn't bode well for Big Beef or Bud Heavy at this point. I think that they're going to be definitely taking the fall. I kind of had a suspicion that the fall would be on Bud Heavy because he's been used in that way. I did couldn't ever imagine it being that Gnarls Garvin was going to take the fall in this matchup with them looking to maybe utilize him and push him a little bit further. Uh, so yeah, this was a this was definitely a big boy match. I did not expect the Saito brothers to be as large as they were. Uh, this harkens back to some of the big boys of Japan pro wrestling of back in the day and stuff like that too, where you'd see a lot of these very larger than life Japanese wrestlers. Uh, these boys are are large, a uh, little bit on the slower side. I could see maybe some people not being into their style. This definitely was worked like a big man match, but at the same time, I didn't dislike it. I mean, it, it felt like a a classic big man tag team wrestling match, your average tag team match on an older wrestling program. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I wasn't sure where they were going with this either because I'd never seen the Saito brothers before, and they kind of came out with no real gimmick going on, and they didn't have the matching trunks or anything, and they were supposed to be brothers, but they didn't really look all that much alike, and mm -hmm. uh, but fairly big dudes, kind of 6'3", 240-pound guys, 
and I wasn't sure who was going to do the job here or not. I, I was kind of hoping that uh, Garvin and, and Heavy were going to go over in this match. Maybe that was going to be their new kind of tag team type thing. I would have been on and, board. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm always so glad to see Bud get on TV and do well. And, and uh, I think this is an interesting and, and logical team up to have Garvin and, and Heavy. But um, yeah, this was a pretty okay match. The Saito brothers looked green as living hell. They were, mm -hmm. you could see they knew their spots in the matches and everything, but they were, like you said, they were slow. They were, uh, just in their movements, you could see they, they weren't uh, seasoned workers kind of thing. But apparently, uh, this is going to be a team that they might give a little push to. I'm not exactly sure, but they got the win this night. I like the way uh, they worked over Bud Heavy for a long time, and then he got the nice hot tag to Garvin and uh, the nice diving hot tag from, uh, from Bud Heavy. I also like the way the uh, the – commentators had that one spot bud was laying on his back and the saito guy was standing on his stomach and uh dombrowski <laughs> said he's six three normally he's seven feet when he's standing on that <laughs> stomach <laughs> that was brilliant absolutely brilliant and i mean you know what bud heavy if you're listening in man like good on you this has been fantastic studio more and more yeah. on television and again i I, I got excited. I was behind the team. I, I would love to see them carry this team on. I think the two of them have just that right kind of, you know, the, the, they have that right kind of chemistry that I think could work as a team. I think they could almost be like that underdog team. Like big beef is more of the, the fighter that could get the job done and stuff like that. Bud might be the guy who's drags them back a little bit, but all in all, when they got that hot tag and beef came in and started laying in those double clotheslines and stuff like that, I was popping pretty good. I was like, yo, I, I like yeah. this team. I, I think yeah. that this personally will help the two of them. I think that Narles Garvin, as interesting as he is, might get lost in the shuffle in MLW a little bit too. Uh, so I honestly think that maybe the tag team route could be a good route for him. Uh, and I think Bud Heavy is just a, a, a fitting match for him uh, in terms of style. I think they could be a fun team. And I think we've seen Bud Heavy get over really well. We saw even the Dallas crowd here uh, was getting behind Bud Heavy. They were chatting for him when he came out as well too. So Bud Heavy... There's, a, there's some steam to be had with this boy. I think we, we're on to something when we decided to call him up and say, hey, come on the show. We, we see potential. For sure. And I could also see, like, uh, we were talking about the patient booking of MLW. I could see them using Garvin and Heavy as a, as a, as a developmental team, as, as a job team, so to speak, for a while until they kind of get their shit together, right? And then they string together a few wins i'm not so sure if they'd go so far as having the tag team titles or anything but if they had a little winning streak then like you said garvin is more of the ass kicking guy that'll get the job done and, and heavy still on the line of being a job guy kind of thing so that that could be a, a good launching pad for a feud at some point too right garvin gets tired of Bud Heavy taking the losses sometimes, so whales on him. Now you can have a little feud between the guys. I, I think it's a good matchup. It's logical. Their gimmicks work well together, and uh, they had some sh shit going on in the ring, too. They had a couple double team moves and all that. They had clearly worked on this stuff, and I'm excited. I'm just always excited for our buddy uh, Bud Heavy. I just wish him all the success. Yeah, me too. And uh, it was good to see him again on TV. Hope we get to see him more uh, coming up soon. And you know what? We, we just need to have Bud Heavy on the show again sometime. And we'll have some fun. And, yeah. Uh, get him yeah. back out. I mean, he's just a good dude to talk to. So anyone watching that hasn't heard of Bud fucking Heavy, go check the dude out. He is a wonderful human being and you will really enjoy getting behind Bud Heavy. Uh, so after that matchup, the Saito brothers picking up the win. We got a, a video package, I guess. This was the dynastic Valentine's Day with Alicia Toot and Richard Holiday. It, uh, this one, uh, it, it served well for what it was. It was them 
coming off heelish. Like they're just into each other. Everybody else is scum. Hammerstone scum. Richard Holiday mentioning that he knows everything about Hammerstone. He knows his weak spots. He knows his injuries. He knows what to exploit when it comes to Hammerstone. And in this promo, I start to believe Holiday that much more as a guy who could eventually go and beat him. And again, like I say, with uh, Alicia too in his corner, again, that has been the turning point for a lot of wrestlers in history too, is you get the right person in your corner that can cause the distraction, make the interference, whatever it needs to be. If uh, they utilize it right and Alicia gets involved, again, it's very believable that Holiday can go over as a champion. Yeah, and I like this interview segment as well because kind of like what you were just saying, it's a classic wrestling trope that when a tag team breaks up and one guy becomes more popular or more successful or gets a belt, who is he most vulnerable to? His old tag team partner, because that guy knows him and that guy will come in and kick his ass every single time. So I, I like this. This That's the perfect kind of tension to build because uh, people would say, well, I don't think Holiday can actually... Ha- stand up to Hammerstone. I haven't seen him have the big matches and the big wins that Hammerstone has. Yeah, but he's in Hammerstone's head. He knows him so well. He knows his injuries. He knows his weaknesses. He knows his strengths, what to avoid and what to go after too. And that's a classic thing from all the tag team uh, tag teams that have broken up and feuded over the years. No one knows you as well as your ex-partner. That's very true. And it's going to be interesting when the payoff does come about that. I believe that we haven't seen uh, everything unfold just yet. I think there's more to come at Super Fight. I think that that match, David Richards, Hammerstone, I can't imagine that that babyface versus babyface clean cut guy world title match is going down without some sort of shenanigans because we know both of those guys have shenanigans going out on in the background both of them have targets on their back from the mlw roster i believe that they are not walking out unscathed from that matchup and we'll see what goes down this weekend so yeah this served out really well and then it led right into the final segment of the night this was going to be the tag team title matchup the ladder match we have got los parks taking on 5150. Uh, again, we have seen this match quite a few times. I like both these teams. Um, the one thing I will say, no more of these two teams in the gimmick matches. This is what it's been every single time with them. While they're very quality teams, I just I am over the gimmicks when it comes to this feud with these two teams. I hope that this feud is kind of done and over with for now. Personally, uh, I want to see 5150 move on to obviously the Vaughn Eric's for starters. I would love to see them go on and take on a bunch of other tag teams down the road as they start to build up this whole thing and really get a run going about them. Uh, 5150. They've got a lot of steam. They're doing fantastic work. I think the future is bright for these two young guys. Uh, I think there was a lot to be said about what was shown in the matchup again, quality from both sides. I think that the, uh, the parks, the young parks, I think have got a great future as well ahead of them. I think uh, it was L.A. Park Jr., if I'm not mistaken, that came off of that middle rope to the outside. A little, you know, organized. The guys were waiting for him kind of thing to do the catch. But again, that's a what they say, a six foot three, six foot four, 240 pound man coming off there. And I mean, being that kind of size myself, I can understand how difficult it would be to do that kind of corkscrew moonsault from that second rope to the outside. So, you know, applause to LA Park Jr. and to uh, Hilo to LA Park for the quality they perform inside the ring. Again, 5150 are, you know, on a whole different level right now. And I think they're taking the tag team world by storm. Absolutely. And, and to bring up another cool spot in that match, in a match that I didn't really enjoy all that much but there were some cool parts in that did you see the part where uh, danny limelight from 5150 jumped from the ring post to the other post kind of uh at where the crowd barriers were and then he did a little twisting uh moonsault type thing off of that that was creative and kind of neat and uh there was some good uh, out of the ring and hardcore stuff. I, I'm over ladder matches. I've, I've seen so many of them. There, there's only so much stuff you can do, really. Um, I didn't love it, but I, I think it's a good feud between these two teams. And I, I'm glad to see uh, 5150 getting some good title matches that they've been defending their titles more than uh, anyone else has been 
defending their belts on MLW TV lately. But um, I was also thinking about 5150 recently when uh, uh, Dave Meltzer's Observer Awards came out for this year. And it, you know, again, it was straight across the board, the same guys that win every year. Uh, and they're his tag team of the year for the eighth year in a row or something was uh, the Cucamonga Young Buck Kids or whatever for, uh, again, the eight times in a row or something. And I was just, I couldn't help but think of 5150, like how you could, you could look at a tag team like that and say, well, maybe they don't have as much experience in the ring as these other guys and all that, but they're hot right now. Mm-hmm. And there you can see that they're committed to this team and, and uh, Boogie and Limelight have been together maybe for about a year now as this tag team, but they've got a chemistry going now, both on the mic and in the ring. And of all the tag teams, there's some great ones kicking around the, the whole world of wrestling right now. But if you went with, who's hot and who's doing kind of the best quality work right now and who is just in there at this moment doing the best stuff. I would go with 5150 from MLW. Like they're just, they're, they're kicking it right now. They're really doing good They're I think they're even overperforming for what their talent level probably is because they're getting some good opponents and they're getting good booking. They've got Conan and, and, uh, Julia smokes with them, you know, it's, it's a good setup. And I think they're they're I think they're the hottest team of this year right now. And uh, I, I I'm impressed with their stuff. I'm looking forward to a lot more. Me too. And you know what? I just thought of something because you mentioned them. It's time for us to cut some promo on Dr. Julia smokes. Once again, here <laughs> on ring respect radio, because guess right. what? Dr. Julia smokes here in Canada. We got the real deal going on. This is Amnesia Hayes. And you know what? I can guarantee you the Papa Smokes and I could sit down with 7 grams, 14 grams, 21 grams, 28 grams of this shit in a row going through it. And we would put a guy like you on your ass. So I dare you. I dare you, Dr. Julius Smokes. Put that name and that legacy on the line. Come up here to Canada or invite us down to where you are. And we'll show you how to get the smoking done. That's right, Julius. I'll take a paper. I'll roll you right up in it. I'll smoke you right down to ashes. And then I'm going to smoke those ashes after that, too. You're you're nothing to us when it comes to smoking, Julius. We love you and everything. But if you really want to keep that name, you got to come up here and challenge me for it. I love it. And I love cutting these promos because it's all fun. <laughs> Dr. Julius smokes. If you're actually listening to the show or anyone sends this to him, man. Let's just do it because it sounds like a good old time. I think we'd have a blast smoking with Dr. Julius Smokes and the boys from 5150. And hey, guess what? If you guys are ever in Canada, feel free. Give us a call because guess what? I think we we have connections to a ring. I'm pretty sure of it. And we have connections to the, the, the green. So, I mean, you know, I think we get the ball rolling here. I think we can tempt 5150 over to the Canadian side here pretty quick, Papa Smokes. Yeah, brap, brap. <laughs> yeah, you got it right. <laughs> but that was MLW Fusion episode 133. It's in the bag. The champions remain around 5150. Congratulations, you guys, for keeping those belts. And congratulations, MLW, for continuing to produce the content that you do. Again, we can sit there and nitpick it as fans a little bit here and there. But, you know, at the end of the day, this is free content, man. We don't have to subscribe to anything if we don't want to, although you should subscribe to their YouTube channel because. It doesn't take very much to do. Just like you should subscribe to our channel. Take the time right now to smash that subscribe button. Really, it's no sweat off your back. Does wonders for us. We know some of you are watching that aren't subscribed. I can check those stats. Trust me, I do all the time. I'm a stats guy. So go ahead, smash that subscribe button down below and just do us a big favor. It's really going to help out Papa Smokes and I continue to get up the rise as we continue to do this Ring Respect Radio thing, uh, bringing you new and uh interesting episodes talking about professional wrestling uh, we got to get back to doing some of the history of professional wrestling again here soon Bob folks we've been doing a lot of the mlw stuff i think now that we're kind of caught up we'll be talking about mlw again hopefully next week or in the coming weeks but i think we should do a history of uh, something coming up we'll uh, have to come up with some ideas and we'll give the fans something to talk about this year 
And also, we got to get together to call some matches. We got some Prairie Pro mat- wrestling matches that are ready to go uh, back from October. We got some of the ones ready for January as well, too. I'm excited about, especially from the ones from January, we did some upgrades to some of the equipment. We got some better at ringside cameras. There's some fantastic footage in there and some fantastic wrestling. It looks great. Uh, outside of, you know what? I, I'm going to say it in our main event. There's a few things I might have to censor as much as I don't like doing the whole censorship thing, but there's a few things maybe mentioned in that final match of the pre pro wrestling night that uh, most people don't want to be uh, subjected to hearing. So we'll, we'll work our magic and make sure that we get that to you very soon. And maybe pop smokes and I will just talk extra loud during those moments. So you don't hear them. Uh, but anyway, pop smokes the floor is yours. You got anything else left to say before we cut this one off? No, no. Great episode, though, Munson. Glad to be back in the chair doing this again. Uh, real life always invades upon our uh, uh, podcast recording time, but uh, we got to do our shoot jobs, too. But uh, we'll, uh, we got to get some more episodes coming up. Love doing it. Love being back and uh, can't wait for the next one. Yeah, it's going to be a great start to the year with this episode and many more to come. We uh, thank you all for tuning in again. Do us a big favor and go check out our friends at Backbreaker Podcast as well, too. A lot of great people doing some amazing work over there. And, hey, outside of seeing me on here, if you want to listen to me ramble and talk shit about professional wrestling in a more PG atmosphere, you can catch me every Sunday on Love Wrestling Sunday Brunch, as well as a a new program that I've got in the works as well, too. It's going to be music to the fans' ears. It's going to be very interesting. More on that to come. So that's all big things coming here in 2022 as we wrap up this episode of Ring Respect Radio. Thank you very much for tuning in. Again, everybody, be kind to each other out there. Take care. When you go to the old saloon at the Dead South End Gonna find you a man there wants to be your friend If you dare to deny his wish, you'll be dead by dawn So give him a drink and a smile and then move right on Rednecks with white faces, don't go putting on down Today